The purpose of this video is to provide instructions for glide bombing with the Arado AR-234's BZA. Similar to the way the aircraft was historically employed during its short service as a jet bomber from December 1944 to May 1945. In IL-2, most ground attacks are made below 1,000 meters, where players often greatly compromise their safety for the accuracy of a drop. The 234's BZA allows players to accurately bomb from medium to high altitudes, and thus evade much of the enemy's AA. The following is based on a tactic spearheaded by veteran bomber pilot Dieter Lukesh, one of the AR-234's most prominent tacticians. He finished the war with over 430 combat missions to his name, including leading the first 234's into combat. Lukesh was a firm believer that the best way to bomb with the AR-234 was using the glide angriff, or glide attack. The tactic saw the bomber initiate a shallow dive from roughly 4 to 6,000 meters and terminated around 2,000 when he released his ordnance. By bombing from such altitudes, it was believed the aircraft could be spared from much of the enemy ground fire while ensuring remarkable accuracy. This was to become the hallmark attack method of the Arado AR-234. Accuracy in glide bombing with a BZA is dependent upon the player understanding various new systems unique to this aircraft. So before we discuss the attack, that is what we will do. We will take a look at each one of those systems, understand what they do, what they mean for the glide attack, and how we can use them. The video is broken down into the following sections. Feel free to skip as desired. In a glide attack, the pilot optically sights the target with his PV-1B periscope. The periscope could be rotated to face the pilot when in use, or rotated to face away when not in use. In IL-2, there is no animation for this periscope. It always appears in the stowed position. These are diagrams of the PV-1B sight picture, and this is the sight picture as it appears in the game. The periscope can be accessed through the following binding. The crosshair is for aiming an optional forward-facing gun pod modification. The vertical line is the bomb fall line, and this is the pipper. The pipper is an impact point computed by the onboard bomb targeting system called the Bomben Zeal Anlage, or BZA. We will come back to this in the next segment. The numbers on the top left denote the position of the pipper relative to the nose of the aircraft, or its zero sight line. The pipper appears in the scope around 22 degrees. The numbers can help the pilot note when the pipper will appear in his sights. The BZA was a complex mechanical analog bombing system, which consisted of various subcomponents to include the PV-1B periscope, an analog computer, a height correction encoder, and more. All of these components came together to produce a solution for the pipper. The pilot tracked towards the target using his bomb fall line, and then released his bomb when the pipper touched the target. In game, airspeed, pitch, and altitude are all automatically accounted for. Bomb caliber is only calibrated for the current heaviest bomb on the aircraft, regardless if a lighter bomb is presently selected. In this photo, SC-250s were dropped while the SC-1000 was still equipped. Because the SC-1000 was still equipped, the BZA calibrated only for the SC-1000, and as such, the lighter SC-250s fell short of our aim point. The greater the difference between the heaviest and your selected bomb, the greater the variance. In essence, the BZA can be understood as an early derivative of the modern-day CCIP or Continuously Computed Impact Point Bombing. In CCIP, systems inside the aircraft automatically account for various aircraft data, such as roll, speed, and pitch, to predict an impact point for its weapons. And like the BZA, the pilot tracks his target with the bomb fall line, and releases his ordnance when the pipper touches the target. If we compare the two side by side, we can note the similarities. Both have a bomb fall line, and both have a pipper. In this regard, the BZA functions very similarly to CCIP, but there is one major exception. 
whereas the F-14 can account for rolls in drift. The BZ-A does not. And as both aircraft roll side to side, note how the F-14's bomb fall line adjusts itself as it dynamically compensates for roll, whereas the BZ-A's bomb fall line instead stays with the roll. In a BZA, if there is no lateral input, the pipper matches the in-game bomb assist reticule. If there is lateral input, the pipper does not match the bomb assist reticule. And this is the critical flaw of the BZA. It assumes the aircraft will always be level. It assumes there is no crosswind. And it only understands the geometries of bombing as a two-dimensional problem. But a bomb drop is inherently a three-dimensional problem. The workaround for this limitation, therefore, requires that the pilot make every effort to make his bomb problem a two-dimensional problem, free of any lateral input, so that the legitimacy of his pipper is not compromised. The moment lateral input is added, the bombing immediately becomes a three-dimensional problem, and will require lateral correction that will be discussed in a later video. Therefore, in order for the pipper to be true, it is recommended to reduce or eliminate variables the BZA cannot count for. Essentially, it is recommended to bomb in line with the wind and without roll or yaw. Prior to a dive, the BZA requires the pilot to input target elevation and wind speed data to compute an accurate solution. A contact altimeter is recommended so the player knows when to pull off the attack, but this is not required. The target elevation data can be adjusted with the following default keys. To learn how to find a target's field elevation, refer to the video linked in the description. Wind speed data is adjusted with the following default keys. The wind speed data asks only for the headwind or tailwind components. It does not concern crosswind. Note, wind speed data in the BZA is expressed in kilometers per hour while the weather reports in-game often express wind speeds in meters per second, so we will have to do some conversions. Use the weather reported at the altitude you plan to release your bomb. If you choose to bomb from an altitude that is not reported, such as 3500, interpolate both direction and speed for the data. The conversion rate from meters per second to kilometers per hour is about 1 to 3.6. If the wind speed is 5 meters per second, I'll multiply that by 3.6 and get 18 kilometers per hour. If it's a headwind, that wind speed value is negative. If it's a tailwind, the wind speed value is a positive. During testing, it was observed that under a headwind, the BZA functioned as advertised, but under a tailwind, further corrections needed to be made. The following chart illustrates the necessary corrections for a given pitch attitude when bombing with a tailwind. Note that different pitch attitudes may produce different correction values. The chart can be understood as such. If the winds are reporting a tailwind at 12 meters per second, we would convert that to kilometers per hour and get a positive 43.2 kilometers per hour. We will apply a correction of minus 5, and our final set wind speed for the BZA is plus 38 kilometers per hour. When using the periscope, the pilot is not able to monitor his altimeter. Without that ability, he cannot know if he has reached his minimum altitude. A useful tool to use during the glide attack, therefore, is the contact altimeter, which serves to notify the pilot that he has reached the altitude he set in his contact altimeter. When this occurs, a buzzer sounds to alert the pilot. The contact altimeter is adjusted with the following default keys. The white needle indicates your present altitude. The red needle indicates your set altitude. When the aircraft is within 250 meters of the set altitude, the buzzer begins. When the aircraft is at its set altitude, the buzzer stops. At the end of the tone, the pilot should recover from his dive. The bomb should be released around and before when the buzzer stops. This is because our BZA solution has been calculated based on the winds at the very same altitude we set on our contact altimeter, and henceforth, also the same altitude we should release our bomb. To clarify some misconceptions, the contact altimeter has no control over the accuracy of the bomb solution, nor the bomb release mechanisms. It simply serves to notify the pilot 
he has arrived at a set altitude. It is not linked to the cockpit altimeter, but instead runs independently off its own equivalent. Lastly, the contact altimeter must be set before the target elevation. Otherwise, the elevation setting will be reset, as shown here. Dropping a bomb accurately is a difficult task. The margin for error only increases with the distance from target at the moment of release. When dropping a bomb above 2000 meters, the legitimacy of the pipper is very much dependent upon the stability of the releasing aircraft in the moments leading to the drop. It is therefore imperative that the pilot keep his aircraft especially stable during the glide attack so that the pipper may be reliably interpreted. The dive component of the glide attack requires an inhumane level of precision flying that is really only achievable with the assistance of automation. Which brings us to our last system. The Patton PDS-11 was a three-axis autopilot system designed to be used in conjunction with the Lot V-7K bombsite during horizontal bombing. It was not used for glide attacks, for our purposes, we will. It should also not be confused with the in-game auto-level function. The key bindings are as follows. To operate, the pilot enables the autopilot master switch and then independently enables the yaw, pitch, or roll channels as desired. To deactivate, either disengage the individual channels or disengage the master switch, which would then disengage all channels. The PDS allows for a level of precision flying not previously possible in IL-2. The pilot can adjust his heading and pitch to one tenth of a degree if he desires. This kind of precision will come in handy for a glide attack. Now that we have covered the 234's various systems and their idiosyncrasies, we can now take a look at the glide attack profile. This red circle here will mark our target, and these are the winds for today. We will begin this example at 4000 meters, here. The glide attack begins with the setup. The earlier that is completed, the better. I've taken a look at the situation and determined that 2,000 meters is the lowest I want to go for this attack. Referencing the weather report found at my bomb site, I see the winds at 2,000 are from 098 at 17 meters per second. I am going to use the winds at 2,000 because that is the altitude I plan to release my bombs at. The wind direction at 2,000 meters will therefore also define my attack line. We want to try to keep this bomb problem a two-dimensional problem that's free of any crosswind. This line will also determine our approach course. We can attack on a 098 heading or its reciprocal of 278. The line is intentionally drawn long so that I can have the flexibility to join the line at any point. Although we are planning based on winds at 2000 meters, I know that the winds at 4000 may be different. The variance today is negligible, but if the difference is significant, Adjust accordingly such that you may track a proper course for your attack line. Where we get established on this attack line is where we will note as our IP, or initial point, the final turn to target. The shallower the intercept angle, the easier it will be to align with the attack line. It is recommended to avoid intercepting the attack line at angles exceeding 60 degrees. Generally, the IP should be spaced such that you have enough time to line up with your attack line. For me, I try to keep my IP at a minimum of 20 kilometers from target. Once past the IP, we'll continue along this course at 4000 meters. If we fly a heading of 098, our course, track, and heading should all match up. Approximately 15 kilometers away from the target, we arrive at our base, where our dive to the target begins. The distance from the base to the target is dependent on your current altitude and the amount of altitude you plan to lose. The higher you are, the further your base should be. The idea is we want to avoid dive angles exceeding 20 degrees. We don't want to pick up so much speed that we induce a mock tuck. Mock tuck generally occurs somewhere above 900 km per hour. Prior to the dive, the setup checklist should be completed. The aircraft should also be trimmed for level flight at the high speeds you will surely be egressing at after the dive. 70% nose trim is a good start. The dive can be divided into three segments. As you enter the first segment, 
enable autopilot, enable all the access channels, and then enter an autopilot dive towards the target. A 5 to 10 degree nose down attitude is a good start. Line up your target with the bomb fall line and make sure you are on the attack line. Any lateral adjustments should be done with the autopilot yaw trim during this phase. If you detect drift, you will need to correct for it by either offsetting your aim or getting reestablished on the course. In the second segment, increase your pitch to 10 to 15 degrees and continue aiming. In the third segment, you can increase your pitch if necessary, but try not to exceed 20 degrees. Commit to the attack. The contact altimeter should be buzzing now or very soon. Release the bomb when the pipper touches the target. If the contact altimeter was never heard, you may have released too high, or the wind speeds are different from what you said on the BZA. If the contact altimeter has already gone off, and you have not released your bombs, consider disengaging from the attack. And finally, segment 4, egress. With bomb release, I will disengage my autopilot and maintain altitude while making shallow turns. You want to egress in a way that doesn't make you predictable for the flak, but also doesn't cause you to lose too much speed. If we visualize this over a map, we now have a plan. Accurate navigation will come in handy. And now we'll see if we can put this plan into practice. Alright, I spawned in in Nerado 234. Um, our target is the Ludendorff Bridge, which is 57 meters in elevation. We're spawning somewhere over here. I want to go and set up the BZA first. I'm flying over the town of Bonn, and I got time, so I'm going to take a look inside my bomb site. Winds are 098 at 17. 17 times 3.6 comes out to about 61. I'm going to go and set the contact altimeter first to 2000. That's when I want to get out of there. Target elevation is 57, and we'll round that up to 60. And then winds are 61, so the headwind, negative 61. And then setup checklist is complete. Alright, so we just made past the IP, uh, turning to the IP. I'm on a 097 heading. It's supposed to be 098, but I'm going to correct for that one degree because I want to make this two dimensional problem. Uh, I'm looking inside my bomb site, switching it to zero degrees so I can verify that I'm exactly where I need to be. There's a forest clearing right over here. That's going to be my IP. Seems like I'm pretty close to it. And um, we're going to continue flying. Gelsdorf, you just saw, uh, it's going to be my base position. That's going to be where I begin the dive. So I'm going to verify that using my bomb site as well. Right over here, you see me make that one degree turn to the right. And there we are, 098. And uh, I'm going to look inside the bomb site. There's the there's the base position. Once that turns to zero degrees on my bomb site, that's when I know I'm directly over it. We're waiting for that to happen. And right when that happens, I go visual. Look inside my bomb site, 098, autopilot engaged. My trim is set. All channels have been enabled, and I'm going to set a 5 to 10 degree uh, nose down pitch. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the aircraft uh, lined up with the target using the bomb fall line and then as I get to phase two I'm gonna continue aiming increase that pitch down to 10 to 15 degrees more aiming using the autopilot yaw trim and then phase three increase to 15 to 20 degrees and then Pipper is alive. I'm just gonna wait for the Pipper to touch the target and then release bombs and get out of there. Release. Alright. Disengage the autopilot. Let's get out of here. I kept my pitch trim at about a 70 to 80 percent, and that seems to prevent the aircraft from nosing up after the disengaging autopilot and I'm taking a couple hits I put a lot of flak on this target as you can see and uh, if I look behind I, I have a lot of flak going up I have both my engines are damaged 
but uh, they seem to be minor thus far. So eventually we made it out, and now we'll go take a look at the track recording and see how the bombs did. And there the bomb lands. I measured this out later. From 2,000 meters, the bomb landed about 12 meters from the aim point. 12 meters is about the wingspan of an IL-2 Stremovic. So that's how it's done. The glide attack lends itself well to the BZA. It turns the AR-234 into a fast and high precision bombing platform, provided the method is performed correctly. The BZA's rather simple design asks much of the player. And it's one of those unique chances in Nile 2 where you really are rewarded for precision navigation and precision flying, all for the perfect drop. I hope you enjoyed the video, and good luck out there.